welcome you and, and also um, um, introduce uh, some of my colleagues that are here. I'm Steve Cassidy, the mayor. Uh, Joyce Rosiak, council members here. Um, Jim Prola um, and council member Michael Gregory, whose district in which uh, this project um, will be uh, developed. Um, it represents uh, council district one. Um, and um, I also want to recognize, uh, we have Mike Katz from the San Leandro School Board. Uh, Ken Pond, former member of the San Leandro School Board. Uh, we have Jan Palma, who's on our uh, BZA uh, commission. Uh, Sue Kleebauer, who's a former member of the Planning Commission. Do we have any other uh, current or former elected officials or commissioners here? <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace. Cynthia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, well, actually, yeah, the most important person for last. Uh, Cynthia is our business development uh, person, and she's going to speak uh, briefly. Michael, do you care to make any comments? Yeah, very briefly. i got one minute to say. Uh, a few years ago, we got a grant to do a study on our transit-oriented development, and <coughs> since then, we've been pouring it on here with a lot of planning. You haven't been seeing a lot of groundbreaking, but that's what this project is about. So here we go. Um, we're going to head down this corridor and build it up, so making the, our downtown desirable and making it more dense and friendly to pedestrians and bikes. And this is part of the plan. So thank you. All right. Well, come on in. We, we have a couple chairs over on this side of the table if you wish to sit. Oh, I'm only hoping I'm in the right place. <laughs> uh, um, and I, 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 all I want to say is just share a short little story. Um, uh, like last year I had a conversation with a a fellow attorney, a uh, friend of mine, who was on the Alameda, City of Alameda Planning Commission for a number of years. And I said, well, how did you make Park Street so desirable? How did, you know, how did that change? Um, and he said what was fundamental to it was that um, they have a successful theater, but the theater was only successful because there was a city garage that was built adjacent to it. And that really transformed the area. Well, we have a city garage that's going to be finished in 2012. Um, you know, not too far away from here. I think that's going to be a great anchor, hopefully, for allowing people to come in to San, downtown San Leandro Park without you know driving around or having a hassle, and then getting out and shopping. And this is going to be another anchor to really redoing, transforming uh, downtown San Leandro and continuing some of the efforts that have been happening in past few years through our redevelopment uh, agency as well. But you know, with no further ado, um, Please, um, you know, thank you again for coming. Please give us your feedback as to what you think of the project and the insight that you have. Cynthia, why don't you take over? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, inform you a little bit about the site because I've received some questions about the history. And this site was the original Lucky Store. It was the first Lucky Store that was ever opened in 1947. And they operated the Lucky Store there until um, Albertsons acquired Lucky's. And Albertsons uh, closed their store in 2005. And from 2005 to 2009, that property sent, sat vacant. And the redevelopment agency saw that property there as an opportunity site for two reasons. We had a parking garage that we wanted to rebuild, but we had um, almost 200 cars in the parking garage, and we couldn't just take down the garage without a, having a place to redirect the cars, because it would really have a huge impact on the neighborhood for that year. So we wanted to inquire the site for um, replacement parking, and we also wanted to acquire the site because uh, this 1.7 acre site was one of the largest sites that was identified in the transit oriented development study that was done in, uh, through citizen involvement and completed in 2007. So we saw a lot of opportunity there to create something different than a field of parking with one store in the back. We thought we could create a development that would have greater density, more pedestrian type amenities, a place to shop, a place to hang out. And, um, and so, so we went forward and it was the redevelopment agency that acquired that parcel. Um, I won't go into the sad story of redevelopment, but what's really true is that redevelopment has assisted us greatly in many of the projects that are going on in, the, our, um, in our downtown and citywide, whether it's the parking garage or the senior center, 
this property, it funds and fuels a lot of our um, economic development activities. So we're anxiously awaiting to see the decisions that the state makes and uh, the um, Supreme Court make, and we're hopeful that we'll have redevelopment on our side in the future to continue our operations. So, um, so we acquired the site in 2009, and then um, right thereafter, we entered into an exclusive negotiating agreement with Innisfree Ventures II. And David Ermer um, is the president of Innisfree Ventures II, and we're very familiar with David Ermer. He built the beautiful, high-quality Class A office there called Creekside Office Plaza on San Leandro Boulevard and Davis Street. Um, we were very familiar with him and comfortable with um, his product and his process. We knew that he could work effectively with the community and that he wouldn't come in with an idea of what the site should be. He would actually work with the community, look at what the work that's been done and identify what was right and, and be sensitive to the community's needs. We also knew that he developed a quality product. We knew by Creekside that he um, paid attention to the details and cared that it looked nice and it worked well in the city. Um, and we knew that he had the financial wherewithal to continue to work. He was one of the um, you know, few projects that obtained financing. It was actually recognized by the San Francisco Business Times as the, no, I can't remember what it was. Developer, developer of the, the year. year. The developer of the year, <laughs> exactly. So we knew that he really had what it take, took to bring us a great project. And um, we're working with him on this project as well as what we call the Town Hall Square site, um, which is the core, uh, kind of triangular site on East 14th Street, Davis, and Hayes. And we'll be coming back to you in the future with plans on that. So I'll let David um, introduce his team. We're happy to have you here, and, and thank you all for coming. It's good to see some new faces and some old faces as well. Thank you, Cynthia. That's quite a report card. I'll try to lift it up. That's tough. I'm in the master's program now. Uh, I would like to first thank each and every one of you for coming out. I know it's the hour is late and your day is long and you still put in the community effort that is necessary to continue growing your beautiful, beautiful place the way you see it. And the only way you can do that is to have some skin in the game. And that's your voice. And I'm here to tell you we're going to listen. Uh, we went through that process many, many times in the past. Uh, and it, it's a successful process. It's amazing how many good ideas come out of the very community you want to develop in. We are guests in your community. I don't live here. I have assets in this community. It's a meaningful community for me to relate to and to be a part of, but I don't live here. So it's up to me if I'm going to be successful with you and bring you something that you will A, appreciate and B, participate in long after it's built, I need to listen to your input. And I thank each one of you for being here this evening. Now I'd like to introduce my team, Michael Stoner, the big tall drink of water in the back of the room. <laughs> Michael, Michael and I have been together for many, many years. Michael is a principal in this uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, Solomon Etzoken, our esteemed and uh, wonderful broker who brings us only the best most of the time. <laughs> and uh, the creator of uh, our wonderful products, uh, Kevin James with MCG Architect. Uh, Kevin and I have worked together now for about 12 years. Kevin was our, uh, our bright light at uh, Creekside Plaza, going through many uh, variations of design and concept and site planning and use of land and creek walks and all that good thing that uh, uh, it takes to bring together a project that not only works, but uh, you'll participate in. So there's a combination. A developer always looks at how 
feasible is this project financially? You know, can it be financed? Does it work from a, an economic point of view? And if the answer is yes, the next process is, is it acceptable to the community? Is it something you want to see here? If the response is no, I don't care how financeable the project might be, our response should be, thank you very much, we'll look to another use. And then certainly third is once it's built, your buy-in at the front end has been as important as the, your participation will be after it's completed. So there is a logical step, a logical process. At Creekside, when we first started that project, I don't know how many <laughs> outreach meetings we had, but there were many. There were many. And, and the bonds that we created out of those outreach uh, were pretty phenomenal. It, it uh, lasts to this day. Billy Eustace was my, my uh, uh, nemesis. <laughs> and, and ended up being our, our best dear friend. Just a great guy and, and his support and his input was important. So he's community and he was living fairly close to the project and we listened and we modified and we got together and, and made this uh, process work. We intend to do the same thing here. What you see tonight is a beginning. It's not the end result. It is the beginning. It's up to us to bring you the vision. It's our vision. It's the outreach vision that we've heard and we think uh, is, is on the right track. But we've got to present something. You can't just start with a clean slate and expect 30, 40 people to design this, this concept. We bring it to you, you pick it apart. And uh, that's where we are this evening. We're bringing you some elevations, we're bringing you a site plan, and we're bringing you a potential tenant mix. Uh, when I say potential tenant mix, I mean the following. You generally start as a shopping center developer with a concept a site plan. You lay the spaces out and you start to relate specifically to those uses as the developer. Then you go out into the marketplace to see if there's any interest. You know, they might say, stick it in your ear, we don't want to come. Or we don't want to be in that kind of center. We don't like that particular mix of tenant uses. There's a whole plethora of uh, traps that a developer can fall into if he's not cautious and he's, he's not sensitive to a whole myriad of interests. Once that's done, you start to line up a tenant interest. You'll hear no a hundred times and then you'll hear a faint yes, I could be interested. And you nurture that. And with that, you co-tenant that. If tenant A says yes, then you know tenant B generally likes to be with tenant A. And so you start to relate to that particular tenant use. And from there you start to build on a theme. And at the end, you've got a wonderful, wonderful theme of real estate, of, of uh, uh, retail uses in a piece of real estate that is de uh, designed uh, specifically to handle the uh, wonderful traffic that this center is going to generate. And, and so there's a lot of, of uh, bits and pieces that, that uh, come about throughout this process. But the number one bit of piece is you people tonight. And what we'd like to do is present our vision. Once the vision is presented, I'd like to ask our architect to come up and tell you a little bit about how we got there. When we first looked at the site, there was a store on it. I've known of the uh, Lucky site since I came to town 12 years ago. The store was there and, and it was a store. It was old and it was tired and it needed to retire, but it was there. So I knew of that site. And when it came available, my knowledge of the area helped me to take that next step, which was to start to understand the community in which it resides the commercial community, 
that it is in. And what we might do to elaborate 14th in a special way. We've got a, a residential uh, facility uh, behind us all the way to 580. Wonderful, wonderful community that can walk to uh, this particular site. So that in itself is special. How many people do we have that we can touch by walking a block or two or three? Not even getting into a car. So that starts to tell you what kind of tenants you might want in that location. You wouldn't put a Costco <clears throat> in a community and expect them to walk to a Costco and handle 125 pounds on their back to go back home. So we started to identify a Mediterranean look and feel. Thus the uh, village marketplace. A food anchor. Let's talk about that. And then what goes with that food anchor and how big can that be? We've got a small site. So many of the grocery outlets, grocery stores want 35, 40, 50,000 and larger. Well, we can't accommodate that. We're just not that big. And if you wanted to get back into a, uh, a lucky store, it would just be a lucky store or its kind. It would be another grocery store and that's all. So we felt as developers that was unacceptable. So we need something that's going to be around 12 to 18,000 square feet of food related and then inline shops along 14th that have a certain spirit, a certain feel to it that will bring our community together, bring people down, relate to where it is and how to use it. So we need plazas, we need gathering spaces. Uh, so if we could get bakery, coffee, uh, some food, uh, some restaurant use, we're going to be on the right path. That's what seems to fit. So we started with uh, our market. Let's see who's out there. And we went through everybody. We talked to everybody that calls themselves a market. And uh, it's pretty slim pickings for our, our size. But then we found somebody that we got excited about, and it's fresh and easy. Right. And we started to look around the countryside at their stores, their distribution centers, the way they operate, their process of hiring local fresh products, everything we understood about the store we liked. We thought uh, a lot of the stores they're in are makeover stores. They're, they're redo. They're, they moved into space and remodeled and tried to make it fit. And some, in our view, do fit. Others don't. But if we could build from scratch, ground up, taking our concept, our design development, and create that 14,000 square foot footprint of a store to uh, not only suit the uh, center, but the community in which we reside, we're going to be where we need to be. So we made a deal with Fresh and Easy. That is in the making. Now we need another very, very positive, very solid anchor that fits with this kind of a center. And that was Pete's Coffee. Now Pete's has been around looking at our community for some time. Uh, I've known of Pete's interest for 10 years, I guess, when Creekside was going to be a shopping center, we were talking to them. Uh, but they never came. This combination of where the property is, the design that we have uh, entitling this site, enticed them to enter into a letter of intent, which is melding into a lease. <coughs> We will build that space up, and uh, there'll be a capstone for this center. There'll be a plaza off of it so that we can uh, identify with outdoor dining, outdoor uses, and uh, really get some enthusiasm for being outside as much as possible. <clears throat> but it's going to be about a 2,000 square foot store. 
So it's not just a kiosk, it's a very, very lovely first class store. Then the other end cap is Chipotle. Now, uh, Chipotle will be in about <clears throat> 1,800 square feet. 1,800, 1,850 square feet. And uh, that again is going to be relating to an outdoor plaza. We have a very identifiable space that uh, we can use for dining and it will not interfere with anything else that's going on in the center and it uh, encourages people from the sidewalk as well as the immediate community to come over and be a part of the marketplace. So that was exciting to us. Uh, another one of our tenants is the AT&T phone store. Slick, contemporary, very, very um, uh, beautiful inside, <clears throat> fitting into our space, and uh, that's about 3,000 square feet. Then we're in negotiations, and th that also is, is a, a, a letter of intent. All of these are letters of intent, melding into leases. Then the food store, <laughs> our restaurant, uh, we're negotiating with somebody that, that is really exciting. And, and I'm hoping we can bring them. Uh, they haven't said no, they've said yes, let's enter into uh, lease negotiations, let's talk about terms, let's talk about money. Uh, so we've not been precluded from going further with this particular use. And it's a great restaurant. So that would just round us out. We're tiny, but we're mighty. We're going to make a statement. Our whole process throughout this has been bring some identifiable architecture. Bring some tenants to fit that architecture and embellish it. And uh, you're going to have a spark downtown that's going to help the people across the street, down the street. It just adds new life. When you have a dark space in any community, it affects everybody. You want lights on, not lights out. So we've got this great, big, grand, beautiful 1.7 acres sitting right square in the middle of our commercial district. Let's use it to its absolute zenith. So we want great architecture. We want to use the very best skill possible to, to bring the quality and the sophistication that uh, this site demands. And I promise you, if you'll look at Creekside Plaza, you'll understand where I'm coming from. I want to float our boat. I want to get rents up. I've had local people tell me, oh, that's too much money. Oh my gosh, you're getting those kinds of rents? That's just awful. No, it's not awful. <laughs> because everybody's going to be able to get a little bit more for their property. And everybody's going to fix up their property. You'll see new storefronts. And you'll see a new invigoration where we had stagnation before. So it's important that we look at all the multiplicity of pieces that go into the creation of this village marketplace. And we would hope that we can encourage each one of you to be a part of it. Call us anytime. Uh, talk to us anytime you wish. If you've got an idea, we'll hear it. And um, this is one of many meetings that I hope we're going to have. I'd like to have uh, our architect, Kevin James, come up and, and maybe encourage the uh, design element of our center and the site plan a little bit more than I have. Kevin is, has been a terrific asset for this town and certainly for everything I've done. So I'm delighted to have you on board. Well, thank you very much. Um, as David said, my name is Kevin James. I'm one of the partners at MCG Architecture, and our firm has had the great pleasure of working with this community for in excess of 15 years. Um, we've done a lot of research. The design team's been around taking lots of photographs of other buildings, details, and so forth. We've been um, participated in a lot of community meetings. And so it's a design team that's very sensitive to a decade plus worth of information that they've yielded from, um, received from the community. 
Um, and so we weren't starting fresh. We were, you know, we have that backup to, to sort of go forward with any other project in, in this community. So again, we feel very fortunate about that. Um, some of the things that we learned through Creekside was um, the community's desire to continue to reinforce, I'm going to say, a Mediterranean, Portuguese sort of history that exists in a lot of its special facilities around the community. And that's something we kept in mind when working on this project. Um, you've got the 14th Street corridor. There's an eclectic mix of different styles of architecture that have matured over probably a, a, a half a century or, or more. And we've tried to capture what we felt was successful within that and develop an architecture that scale-wise spoke to the, the street, material-wise took another step up with quality. Um, in our materials, we've got natural stones, bricks, um, smooth plaster finishes. This is going to have a very craftsman's type feel to it, um, a very old world historic flavor. Um, and that is what we were trying to achieve. Um, we feel it speaks to the other retail on the street, across the street, Pelton Place, um, that this is an appropriate approach for what we see um, that's been successful in this community. Um, some of the things with regards to the site plan. So we spent a lot of time looking at a variety of options. This is um, a petite site, and we heard that the type of project we're wanting to incorporate here is an interactive project. It's a project that has lots of visual people utilizing it. Um, one of the things we wanted to be very sensitive to was that we were supporting that street frontage. We were making it a pedestrian-friendly um, exposure to 14th Street and to those pedestrians moving along the sidewalk. Typically, in a project like this, you would have all of your entries, all of your glazing focused towards the parking field. We did not turn our back to 14th Street. 14th Street is dealt with every bit as sensitive as the other frontage of the building. So there's going to be a lot of visibility into these stores, going to be um, a lot of visibility to see people and activity going on, as well as because of the types of tenants that David's described, the food uses, um, the type of grocery store that we're talking about, um, there's going to be a lot of outdoor activity, a lot of patio use. Um, when we see people outside the building, which we are trying to promote, it delivers a message of use, it delivers a message of security. Um, people draw people. It is the exact types of spaces that we want to litter along the 14th Street corridor. So if, if you look at the the site plan, we've got outdoor dining out towards the corner. We've got a very healthy plaza with, with landscaping and softscapes and hardscapes. Um, you know, if you've been out to Creekside, the, the antique light lamp posts with um, flower baskets. Um, landscaping on a project like this is, is imperative that we do something very special. It softens and makes spaces very comfortable for people. So it will be another level of design that will be folded into this that again, it's not a concrete jungle, it, it, it does have a softness to it. Um, so we've exposed the stores to the street, we've added the, the outdoor plazas, and we envision that that 4th Street corridor is going to be very active. Um, again, the type of grocery store that's here, it's, grocery stores have changed quite a bit. This is not just a store where you might go do your shopping for a week or two weeks. It's a store where you might go and just pick up dinner for the night or pick up some pre-cooked stuff and, and, and utilize the plaza to eat it. It's, it's, a, it's a concept that's got a lot more interactivity going on, a lot more use than, um, again, that Costco, uh, Safeway, to, you know, you're going to your car and buying six bags of groceries. This is, this is probably got a smaller ticket per person and much more frequent um, an individual you utilize the store maybe three, four times a week. Um, again, playing into the type of development, the type of project we're proposing. Um, so again, back to the architecture. We felt it was appropriate to propose something in scale with the street. Um, we, we go back and forth between one, two stories. We have our large icon tower element that we felt was a was be a, an appropriate feature that delivers a message from a distance up and down the corridor. Um, again, lots of glazing towards 14th Street, lots of um, classical details, pediments, um, exposed timbers, 
uh, accent light fixtures, carriage type lamps, um, clear story windows, uh, allowing for, again at night, more lighting opportunities, clay tile roofing. Um, so again, a, a lot of things that sort of play to some of the architecture that, that already exists in the community. And then for our plaza, if you look over here, we see it as a great opportunity, you know, a water feature, hardscapes, lots of patterns, lots of interest. Again, the, the, the quality of material creating interest for the pedestrian, that 12-foot zone that the pedestrian can feel, touch, get close to, as well as something very attractive for the automotive, um, the automobiles going back and forth on 14th Street. Um, so again, landscape is going to be a crucial element. We don't have too much to present to you here, but that's certainly one of the, the next components of design that we'll be focused on. Um, you know, being able to properly screen and shade the, the parking fields, adding accent trees and so forth along 14th Street that play with the architecture. Another thing that we were very concerned about, or we we're always very concerned about when we we're talking about a commercial environment, is the overlap of automobile and pedestrian and bike, and how they can coexist in a safe manner on site. Um, so we've got no access on 14th Street, which provides the pedestrian a very smooth and easy way to, to work their way into the project. We've got designated two designated automobile spots, so we're not congested, they're not clogged, just going in and out one entrance that they've got multiple ways to relieve the parking field. Um, and the bike facilities that would be provided on site will be spread around so that they're convenient to all the different tenants on site. Um, so again, this is a, a, intended to be a very interactive project, one that's getting a lot of sharing of, of, of customers in between the tenants, and one that we feel, at least our desire was to um, incorporate something very much the scale and style that, that fit what we've heard from the community um, over the last 15 plus years. So with that being said, I've walked you through our, uh, our village marketplace. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, Cynthia. Yes. We want these nice people to interact with what they've heard. Great. So how are we going to do that? Well, um, we could, maybe everybody wants to go around the room and just introduce themselves, and they can say a word uh, if they'd like to. Because well, I, I, I know many people here, but I don't know everybody, and it would be nice to get to know you. So I am overwhelmed with the turnout. <laughs> I yeah, am absolutely wonderful. delighted beyond measure. Does that sound Great. good? I'm Matt Jones with Robert Jones and Associates in San Andrew. And I'm George Brown, and I'm here for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and you can share an idea or a comment if no you problem. have any. Okay, great. Okay. I'm Joyce Starosiak. I'm on the city council. I provide the entertainment for George. <laughs> I'm Johan Dichter, and I've taken um, an interest since I moved to San Leandro about the development that we're having here. So I am concerned about it. and. I'm, I'm happy to see um, that we have um, a, a relatively good plan. The only thing that I would like to see is I have a problem um, with getting good produce and that sort of thing. So I would like to see kind of um, an upscale produce market or something like that. And we have something like that, as I told you, David, over on um, you know, MacArthur. And she specializes in organic and produce. So. For me, that's kind of an important issue. I know we have the farmer's market now, which is good, so but we don't have that year around in our neighborhood. So, But I think the plan looks good. I like the architecture. I think it's going to be an asset. It looks good. I'm Kaya Balka, and I live around the corner from that on the Lawrence. So I'm very interested in what you're going to end up putting there. Um, I'm very, I, I like the architecture. I like the openness. I'm, I'm very happy that Pete's is coming. Yeah. I will be hanging out there. I am not happy about your choice of grocery store. Um, as she just said, I want a place where I can get produce. I want good quality produce. I want to be able to get, you know, some organic things, bulk foods. Um, I don't buy pre-made foods that are high in fat and sodium, which is what Fresh and Easy sells. Um, so it's, you know, I guess it's, trade-off. You have to wait and see what you actually will come up with. 
I, the other thing is, I would love to have a place somewhere to go at night where you can like listen to music. Yes. How about, you know, like a decent place that plays some blues, you can go and have a beer or a glass of wine and sit outside. It's, um, I spend all my money in Oakland right now. I would love to be able to spend it in San Leandro. The mayor just loves to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you have to give me something that's worth spending my money on. Which fresh and easy did you? Did the one in Hayward. Shop. Well, I haven't shopped there. I just I went there yesterday when I saw that you were proposing one here. So I went there and I picked up the sales flyer and I talked to um, the gentleman that was working on the uh, installation there. So what is fresh and easy supposed to stand for if it's not fresh? No, they have produce. It's fresh. Their oh, so produce the is sold individually. You, you can buy an apple for you know it's sort of like Trader Joe's. You mean in the Target Center that hasn't yeah. opened yet? Um, there's one that is open down on Mission Street. And their produce aisle is about the length from here to that wall. Half half a That's side. That's it. A, a good one to go look at is a Danville. Yes. It doesn't represent the architecture that we're talking about here, as David talked about, that this is a standalone, that we get lots of opportunities to do things differently. But Danville is a good example of what you see inside of Fresh and Easy and what you would see from produce in, different, in the store. And I, I think that they have a policy of also being responsive to the community. Yeah. They do have organic goods and they do have fresh produce. And, and I'm, I'm sure as an intelligent, assertive consumer can, can engage that and, and maybe, maybe find maybe one day. Really so that they can find it. They're really, um, I mean, state of the art, aren't they? Progressive in the way they think it's a business. Yeah, you know, my understanding, Solomon, is we started talking with Fresh and Easy like four or five years ago when they first came to America. They've been really hovering about looking at getting into this community. Actually, I think Serlina is the one who um, brought them and introduced us to them. And they said that prior to opening the store, they actually went out into the community and did surveys and talked to people about what they bought, what was in their cupboard. They were very curious so that they could stop the market right and so they could divide their space. And I'm not sure if they're still doing that in their new stores because they've now been in America. They, they research it at NAS in the yeah. research department and right. stops. So. They spent three years developing the concept. Right. I mean, a little history on Fresh and Easy. Fresh and Easy is, is owned by Tesco, which is a grocery store in UK. Um, there's a change in the marketplace where you have a lot of specialty grocery stores, smaller grocery stores that are kind of finding the niche, as David talked about, the daily shopper as opposed to the, the uh, kind of the bigger buying spree, if you will. And when Fresh and Easy started about um, four years ago, five years ago, about four yeah, years ago. up in their first store in like the end of the so, so, so after about two years, they found that um, about two years ago they kind of stopped their development and they put it on hold because their product mix wasn't quite right for the US market the design wasn't quite right and they went back and kind of um, re-engineered it, readjusted based upon um, what the marketplace here was looking for in the US and so what you've seen over the last nine months are a series of stores that are kind of from that education they do have, you know, individually, um, you know, labeled so you can buy the one apple and, and check out yourself and go out quickly. But you do have a little bit of <coughs> two generation stores that are out there. And so I, I have not been in the Hayward one, so I can't it's compare not it. Yet. Okay. Um, but the Danville one's a good example of what you'll see there. It definitely does not have a large produce session. It, it has pretty much all the items that you would see, say, in a safe way. So if you needed your laundry detergent you can get it but it's not going to have the depth it's really for kind of smaller binding items and they do have a lot of prepackaged that that definitely is you know part of the um, attraction but I can also see how that may be a detraction and, as well. they're, and they're a price leader and the prepackaging allows them to you know logistically deliver better pricing but everything is quality stamped uh, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'm here to listen, but um, but also make a comment. Uh, the, there is a fresh and easy opening in Hayward. It's in South Hayward. Um, they're opening up a new one in North Hayward, too. Um, but, Tomorrow. Okay. But I'll say is, um, 
I'm not so interested in us talking to the fresh and easy folks after it's open. I'm interested in you talking to the fresh and easy folks before it's open, based upon the feedback that you get here. Great. Okay. Yeah, I, um, Rhody Stevens were also Dolores residents uh, above uh, Bancroft and interested in, in the site. Um, <clears throat> I think a couple things. Uh, one, um, I think that the, the likely pedestrian corridor that you're going to probably get more um, flow through than otherwise is going to be Englander through the Pelton Center and across East 14th to this site, then necessarily up and down East 14th, because when you get mm -hmm. when you get north of this property, you really don't run into uh, as many uh, interesting properties right now, although that will develop over time. So I would like to see or have you consider um, a, a, uh, a footbridge over East 14th between Pelton Center and this location. Um, I think that could actually be an advantage to both both properties. Um, I, uh, you know, there there is uh, there is going to be a, a constraint on parking. You know, four four spaces per thousand square feet is is pretty tight, and you're going to need to have other surface parking. The, the parking lot here in in the uh, in the shopping center is always impacted, as you know. There is additional parking available potentially, I guess, in the uh, the old Ebmud site uh, where there was the Ebmud building and it's now a vacant lot and there's excess parking at the Bank of the West parking as well, perhaps, um, that might be able to feed that, that pedestrian corridor. Um, I don't know if you funded public art uh, for, for this project, but I would strongly suggest a minimum percentage uh, of 2% for public art for this location. I think it would fit very nicely into your overall idea about creating a, a, a public environment. And um, if that's not part of the, the planning guidelines for the city, that it would be something you'd adopt uh, gratuitously. Um, I, you know, I don't know anything about about fresh and easy. I won't speak to it. I know I know my lovely wife probably will. Um, but um, I think that was. Pretty much all the comments. Thank you. I'm Stephanie, his wife. I work here. We've lived here for about 15 years, raised all of our kids here as well. And I have to say, fresh and easy. I've been to several in LA. Never had heard about it. And my son's friend worked at, has worked there for years in LA, Orange County area. And I love the store. And I love fresh produce. And I love farmers market. And I love fresh and easy too. So the one I saw had all kinds of wonderful things. Um, and the prices were very reasonable. That's what I have to say about that store. It's very reasonably priced for people who are watching um, their wallets. The other thing is I'm thrilled about Pete's. Absolutely thrilled. I mean, huge, 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 huge. Um, and then um, I, I like the design. I do. I really like the design. I like how it feels very open. Um, lots of walking. You know, farmer's market is packed. Everybody who lives here knows it's absolutely packed on Wednesdays. And there's people all over downtown, and I think it would be a wonderful magnet to have this place that's very usable to um, the community. So, I mean, if it's going to if it's going to drive anything, it might drive uh, Estudio Produce to become more of an organically focused I love market. Estudio. We love Estudio Produce. They're, kind of, they're closed at six or six thirty. Yeah, that's early a for me. They're closed on Sundays. Um, I can't. So. Thank you, um, Larry Alfin, um, I own Alfin Jewelers. I'm a downtown retailer. My family's been downtown since the early 1970s, and I'm uh, keenly interested in the future of downtown. I'm Jane Grayson. I lived downtown for about two years, and now I live over in a mobile home park. But I thought I'd come and see what you were offering and see what it looked like, because I used to walk between here and the hospital almost every week see and I'd be walking past that lot and that saying, what are they going to do with it? <laughs> and I will say that on an overall basis that I, I think the plan is pretty good. I'm not quite sure why you're leaving it only to one story and why you can't create more tenants by giving a second story to it. You know, you know, so that you can sort of keep a sort of a permanent uh, change of people coming and going. And you know, the, the thing I had in the back of my mind was maybe getting one of the universities to 
leave some uh, upper level part of the building, or any building, whatever you put in there. And like the, you know, Berkeley could have a downtown center, and or maybe uh, Hayward State or any of the, you know, they'd have the graduate programs because they're not going to do this for undergraduate. And uh, they had the BART three blocks away, and they had the R, the number one running up and down. The, so I mean, it would be something to just keep the revenue going a little bit, as well creating more people to be here you know, as a place to come to. And they certainly would like Pete's coffee and <laughs> a few other things. So that's why I'm here. Um, do you want to address that that issue? I mean, because we've we've talked about uh, originally. Level. A second level and what it was envisioned for in the TOD strategy was was it four stories there was a, um, a four story over, over over the retail right four stories over retail so yeah. it was a very large and dense project and we've run into issues just having to do with the market right now that that's right. not economically viable but I'll let David speak every more point about you that. made is a great one I would love to see a second level there Mm -hmm. uh, it means more revenue for us, more revenue for the community, but these projects are parking driven. And if you don't have enough parking for your tenants, they won't come. Double deck parking. And, well, then you run into problems with your neighbors. We have neighbors right up against the property line and the last thing they want to do is look out their window into steel and concrete. So. Uh, it, if it becomes too dense, we start getting tenants pulling back. When we first uh, created the concept of retail on the ground floor, and let's maximize the retail, uh, Trader Joe's was on the top of our list. Let's try to get at Trader Joe's once again, one more time, and we made a heck of a run at it. But uh, there is absolutely no interest from any tenant if you start stacking on top of them. You start putting things on top of the tenant, they lose identification. Forget about parking for a minute. Let's assume uh, you could put stack parking, you know, a structured parking. Not even stacked. Have you ever seen the marketplace in Rockridge? Sure. Been there a hundred times. Yeah. How, or the Trader Joe's over at Lakeshore? I have. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I mean, you know, you're trying to create a commercial space. I don't want to take someone else's time here because no, I have a lot of things I want to say. But, sure. um, but I want to hear what other people say because I'm agreeing okay. with some. And not others. All right. Yeah. Going going through the design development uh, a stage of site planning, and then you you get a site and you take it to the tenants, and they say, "Well, what are you doing here? What what's you mean? I can't just park." out into a field of parking, we have no interest. We're, we count us out. So we struck out on anything that, and we were going to build housing. We were going to build retail on the ground floor with apartments above. And it just wasn't going to work. Well, do you think maybe it was the apartments and the fact that it was residential yeah. rather than... Well, commercial? then we went after office. Yeah. Then we said office. How about two small, levels small office. of office? Smaller office. That, 1,800 square feet, 1,500 square feet, the smaller office component, that would be fine. I don't know that there's a big market for that in town. Because right, right. I'm in that business. I've got 235,000 square feet of office. And and I haven't had very many bites just, on small just space. Because what they have, I think, over in the Rockridge um, one is so just, they just have a few small office spaces you yeah. know, off on the side there. Um, just to give some more depth to the whole space. Yeah. So, so anyway, you could you could get your office component, but you can't you can't get the retail. Right. So if you went all office on the whole site, you don't want that. Not in the middle of your town. We're trying to create some retail in this corridor that is unique and special, and and a sense of leisure. And, and, and being in that space in a very comfortable manner. And if we start to max the uh, site out with uh, mid-rise, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose that particular component. And we were unsuccessful at trying to marry 
uh, density, you know, getting 100,000 square feet uh, with the uniqueness of the retail that we're talking about tonight. So five, five you'd be having to give up. Five years ago, you could have done it. We could have done it. And maybe five years from now, very, or 10 very, years from now. Very possible. But in this economy, this it's just it's not possible. So, so this, Cynthia, the other item is, is yeah. there are communities